Yeah, yeah. a little bit different than rhythms. Uh, hard to follow up on that one, but I will try my best. Uh, this is a little bit lighter of a lecture. Dr. Willis, we spoke about what I was going to talk about. I did have a change of heart last yeah. minute, but I won't disappoint you. <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. Um, so uh, the reason why I made this title obviously is to call attention to, I, I think mostly the junior residents, the senior residents that are rising as well, but for them to really think about what makes them happy within uh, emergency medicine. Um, I, for me, I'm going to, or hopefully going to explore a lot of avenues coming uh, as an upcoming attending. And I feel like I want to practice a little bit outside of the hospital scene. Uh, that does not mean I want to give up emergency medicine. It just means uh, maybe the hospital is not for you right now. And I think it's important to ask yourself those questions as you're going through residency. Um, it's not going for some reason. Okay, there we go, there we go, there we go. <laughs> All right, so I wanted to start with, hi, Dr. Casey. <laughs> How's it going? Um, so I wanted to start with County Strong. I think it's important to actually thank our mentors more than anything. Looking at you, Dr. Kendall. Um, really, um, I think uh, mentors are patients. The training that we get here is uh, it's not comparable with anywhere else. We see patients that are from all levels of, um, you know, from very sick to uh, a patient that we're just seeing on fast track. And I think uh, that. Uh, ability to have that diversity is uh, I couldn't ask for better training I couldn't ask for um, better experience in terms of making me a stronger resident uh, and in attending so, so thank you but um, I do have to say I am in a way, I, after four years of going through this, I do want to step away a little bit from the hospital mentality. I think the lack of windows, maybe a little bit of the politics within medicine in the hospital um, is something that I want to step away from and uh, go back to my EM roots, actually uh, learning, appreciating my few and uh, exploring all different avenues that I can within the field. Um, I think we do see um, our daily basis, uh, kind of that we get used to, our chart here that I think is pretty accurate with our ER. So sometimes you want to step away from that. Um, and also having your days off, sometimes you don't have energy to go outside, enjoy your life the way you want to enjoy it. Um, and I think part of it is just, um, you deal with so many things on a daily basis and you're in an enclosed space that it's very difficult to, um, even on your days off, when you have two days off even, you just want to be in bed and do your own thing, watch Netflix, do whatever makes you happy. So um, I, I do wanna talk about, again, much less cerebral, but whatever uh, makes you happy in EM, like create your own path uh, that actually means something to you. I think uh, we often ignore or neglect what uh, we need to do for ourselves uh, that will make us happy in this field. We all chose the end for a reason. We all love emergency medicine, but I think sometimes we think that we need to be in an academic field only, which is not actually the scope of EM. EM is supposed to incorporate some wilderness, some, uh, 
you know, sports medicine disaster international for me, it's a lot of international, but for a lot of you guys might be different aspects of it. And uh, of course, uh, health policy is something that I find so important. And just like Hassel was just mentioning now it's preventive medicine to me is one of the most important things in, uh, in EM is something that I found that I can do uh, in international medicine, particularly when you're creating policies. Uh, but really, I ask myself, why do I have to do a fellowship in a particular field? Why do I have to go into wilderness or sports or uh, uh, policy international? And I just sort of stepped away from that perspective and started thinking about I have excellent training. I've gotten excellent training. I'm able to address all disputes. So that's what I would like to do as an upcoming attending. And I hope that you can also feel the same, especially our junior residents that are going through it, through the steps. If you question yourself through it, I think it will give you a little bit more clarity on uh, what you want to go into instead of just signing up for a fellowship or going into necessarily just academics. Um, so my first example, it's I'm going to keep it as light as possible. It is a person, uh, it's uh, medicine within sports medicine. So uh, this is a major sports event. It is actually a motorcycle sports event. I've been a fan of motorcycles for a long time. <laughs> Since uh, before I got my driver's license, I got my motorcycle's license. And um, I certainly, it's something that uh, I've been watching since I was 14 years old. It's in a race for all F1 fans out there. It's uh, similar, but in the motorcycle world. Uh, and I think that to me, I really found a way to uh, admire someone that was able to tie in sports medicine with being the best emergency doctor uh, that they can be. And I will talk about that. First, I'm going to talk about while what IO of Mentee actually is. So it's a motorcycle race. It takes place in the northern of Ireland. This is, uh, it's been going on since 1907. <laughs> it's an incredible race. You can see how much things change over time. Uh, it is a small island and people actually are going through this path. I don't actually, I don't think you can see the mouse, but there, if you look at the upper picture, people are going through this path through these beautiful banks uh, and uh, as their race course and at any point they can have a really bad injury in terms of this is a really difficult geography to work with as well as uh, the, the magnitude of injuries that you actually see in these kind of uh, sport events are very severe and you have to be able to act very fast in the field if you are the doctor there. Um, this is the appeal to me. Okay, so this is uh, Dr. Joan Hines. Uh, he is an incredible doctor. He is Irish. He trained in emergency medicine and he did a fellowship in critical care, but he had a very enthusiastic uh, view on keeping his passion in sports medicine, incorporating that into his daily life and actually able to uh, combine those two things, uh, being in a sport that he loves and actually rescuing people that suffer injuries from the sport. So um, he is, the upper guy up there that is riding in his motorcycle, he's one of the first responders. Uh, motorcycles usually get there much faster in this race than ambulances, firefighter trucks, as well as helicopters. Uh, they usually are going anywhere from 150 miles per hour to 170 miles per hour. 
And uh, this man carries about 25 pounds of weight within his motorcycle, including anything from harnesses for rescuing purposes. So keeping his sense of adventure to intubation uh, equipment to real trauma-based equipment that we have here. So you can see it in this picture and they really make their uh, feel a trauma bay. It's, uh, it's just like what we do in our own trauma base. So I will play a video so you can get a sense of, good, except it's not, uh oh. Say that again? I'm sorry. You have to get the, it just you have to click on the active screen like that. No, I am. Here, I don't know. Here, like this. this one is the other thing. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Where is the mouse? Yeah. yeah. Okay, there it is. All right, there we go. That should do it. Oh no, that's the other one. <laughs> there you go. Okay, so this is Dr. John Hines. <laughs> Um, so in Ireland we're quite unique, we're one of the few places in the world where we still do motorsport on closed private roads. Um, so whenever we race motorbikes back home, uh, we do it on the highways and byways. And you can see from this picture of me at Armoy, um, there's not an awful lot of room there. There's a lot of spectators in the background. Uh, this is about 165 miles an hour. Uh, we're jumping about three feet in the air um, and the guys that are really fast are much faster than I'm going over this. So if Twitter's taught me one thing over the last year, it's that anaesthetists are fairly boring individuals. They sit in theatre, uh, they give propofol and they put laryngeal masks in and they read the paper. Um, well, I'd invite anybody to come and sit in my office with me at the weekends and we can see how exciting anaesthetists can be. And you can do that as a doctor. You can love your environment, do what you love in terms of sports and anything else, as well as being a first, uh, first rescuer, essentially. So um, I'm going to give you one of the examples of second <laughs> So this is one particular uh, terrible crash that happened in 2010, uh, the 2010 race. Um, his name was uh, Connor Cummings. Uh, he's still alive and was racing right away the next year. But uh, I just want to show you the magnitude of some of the injuries that do actually happen to these uh, athletes. Oh. Yeah. And he went back to the school? Oh no. Hold on. <laughs> there is more. Did you write dollars in the work that you did? No. So I know I, I know this is gruesome for a lot of people. Um I, I do think though that you have to look at this lecture with an open mind. Okay. There are people out there that still admire the sport, want to be part of it, but they want, they are still doctors. They are still people that want to help these people fulfill their dreams of actually racing and continue racing. So in terms of interventions, thankfully, uh, he was there, uh, Dr. John Hines. And uh, the first part of it is actually a rescue mission because uh, he fell so far into the banks that they had to harness him 
back up into a safe space where they could actually turn it into a trauma bay and be able to resuscitate the person. So that is the first half of it, as in disaster medicine, you secure your, your brown, it is uh, the same uh, thing with this. Uh, the second thing is uh, Connor Cummings, the motorcyclist, he was actually talking at first when they rescued him, and then he soon became unresponsive, apneic, and uh, essentially they found a lot of injuries, as you can see from the, the, those, that very brutal image of, uh, he had bilateral hemothoraces. He also had a high C-spine injury, uh, including C2, C3, and C4. Uh, and he had a dislocated knee with a very unstable comminuted femoral fracture, as well as an open mid-humeral uh, fracture. So he was actually losing a lot of blood, um, as well as with the bilateral hemothoraces, he wasn't able to breathe. So right in the field, they realized that uh, he, it's, it would be two hours away to drive into a major trauma center. They were able to stabilize him on the field, dropping bilateral chest tubes. They started MTP on the field. They started antibiotics in him. They also reduced his knee and were able to actually uh, reduce the femoral fracture because it was so unstable and were able to load him into a helicopter. And you can see here uh, in the latest image that uh, all of the, the hardware he ended up getting out of it, but he was actually, to answer your question, Dr. Senator, he was racing the next year. All right, I know you don't agree with it, but I have to say, keep an open mind and an open heart when you are treating your patients. It's okay to, to do those things. Exactly, right? So my takeaway from this, which might be different from your takeaway, but I just encourage you to at least think about it is really, uh, for me, this is exciting. It's delivering really life-saving, faster measurements uh, to these patients that are undergoing a severe, severe trauma that would not have survived otherwise if they had flown away to a hospital just with paramedics. Um, it's really making the field, the road, the tent, uh, the ambulance, and the helicopter your trauma bay. It's exciting for you and it's amazing for the patients as well that you are treating and uh, keeping a sense of creativity when you are treating your patients it's really uh, the rescuing part of it as well as the uh, uh, ability to work with very limited resources is something really exciting for a lot of doctors and i encourage you to explore those things so Going into a little bit different of a topic, um, as I said, I think uh, this is just to for a lot of particularly the junior residents and the upper to explore. Um, yep. No. Okay. Uh, it's to explore your your what what you actually love. Uh, when you feel entertained by every day. So international medicine, obviously resource limited medicine has been one of the main things that I've gotten involved with uh, from the beginning of residency. I feel like it challenges me more than anything. It makes me think in different ways that I think when I'm in a hospital where I could just pen scan people, where I can call trauma overhead and where I can uh, stabilize people uh, in, in certain ways that I'm not able to do that in the field. I think, I think a lot more about wilderness things in terms of, uh, uh, as you can see, Eric, Holding here, this was a poisonous steak, but there are a lot of, uh, <laughs> of uh, snakes that are poisonous here. Uh, and as well as uh, really being in a small room and doing ultrasound as you're 
point of care uh, uh, point of care uh, intervention for people as you don't have CT scan available as the only thing you really have is ultrasound and x-ray in these patients it's really also self-fulfilling because it it you have to be able to cover all bases you have to be able to stabilize a patient from beginning to end and that you have to trust on your physical exam you have to trust on the vitals that you see on the patients and you have to trust on your team and that's something that sometimes i think in uh, a hospital setting uh, you can uh, trust on images uh, and 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 other things that in international health, you really, uh, you, you can't. And uh, Belknap, I have to give a shout out to him because he's incredible. He started this from the very beginning in Tanzania. This is the Kingeti Fund. I know most of you know uh, about it, but uh, truly he started this from the very beginning and is carrying it through it until we are able to influence as uh, many people impart our knowledge and then step away and allow our uh, fellow uh, ER workers in Tanzania to actually make up their own policies, their own healthcare system. I think, again, policy making is, takes a huge part in uh, international medicine. And that's something that we as doctors here in the United States, we don't get to do enough of. Um, a lot of times we do get to um, uh, make work with people to make policies, but uh, this is really coming from a, a doctor's perspective and as much as possible trying to be uh, effective with money as we are often in very low budgets as well as um, uh, working with very resource limited places and trusting really what we have. <laughs> and I think, again, going back to your happy place, uh, what matters to you, to me, is really, is being able to walk to the market after a shift and getting fresh fruits and getting palau, which is an incredible dish in Tanzania as well as watching the sunset, uh, being able to take a walk in the mountains and being able to go to a beautiful island uh, on my days off. And it's, it's really, um, I, I don't think we need to feel guilty about those things. I think that's part of being a, a doctor, enjoying your environment, enjoying where you work. And then the last example, I did want to show, I'm not sure how I am in time. Okay. Um, this is a new field that I gravitated towards. Uh, huge animal lover. And I think that a lot of people would appreciate this. And as I know, a lot of you guys have dogs, cats, and mini horses, I'm not sure. <laughs> but I think animal rescue missions uh, are starting to actually incorporate EM doctors into their rescue missions. They a lot of times have rescue missions for days to weeks. Uh, these are very dire conditions. Uh, these are also incredibly remote places where they're nowhere near a hospital, a level one trauma center. They can get anything from bites to severe limb injuries to fall from very um, from uh, various heights and and have uh, a very uh, serious injury. So I think, uh, thankfully, uh, we started incorporating within our vets also EM doctors that care for our uh, rescue uh, team that is uh, going into these missions that they're going into these wells, they can get hypothermic, hyperthermic in terms of the conditions where they are. They get severe bites, they get severe limb injuries, like I said. And I think uh, it's very far for them a lot of times to get into uh, hospitals and be able to be treated. And this is more of a few medicine um, aspect of it, just like I showed you in the motorcycle uh, 
the in uh, Dr. John Hines lecture before where he was able to stabilize people in the field. I think this is important as well with this sort of mission. Um, this is one of the uh, companies that I love. Uh, they've done a lot of good work and they were the first ones to start incorporating EM doctors into their rescue missions. Um, it's called No Dog Left Behind. They actually take a lot of their uh, they take at least one EM doctor now into their bigger missions. And I think it's incredible because you get to, again, uh, deliver, you, you get to do what you love, which is rescue and working with the animals, as well as helping these wonderful people that are doing their jobs to heal if they are exposed to a lot of these um, uh, body injuries or and then of course my own experiences uh, this is what made me gravitate towards uh, thinking outside of the hospital field which is obviously all my injuries I survived everything girl I have to say you gave me a bald spot <laughs> but I love you for it, <laughs> but yeah, everything uh, I, I, I did indeed learn a lot from the ER doctors that had treated me in the field as well as uh, in small little community places where I thought I was not able to gonna get, regain function of my limbs and uh, they, I was stabilized is at least in Vancouver, I was stabilized uh, twice by this small ER doctor that reduced my life because it was so unstable. And uh, before I flew, I, I was able to fly into a bigger uh, actual level one trauma center where a permanent ORF was performed. So I am thankful for those people. In conclusion, Let's keep a like because Dr. Willis left already. Uh, find your passion. I mean, really, we're all here. We all love emergency medicine. It's not a secret to any of us, but you have options. You don't have to stay. It doesn't have to be academic versus community. It doesn't have to be as separated as that. You can encompass things that you like in different fields and you can actually uh, flourish within them and, and find your passion and really believe in it. Uh, as much as uh, you may get some unsolicited advice and you may get uh, some pushback, you have to really be happy with what you're doing in terms of work. It's, if you are not satisfied with your work, you will not be satisfied with your life. And that's how we are as doctors. We truly are, we give everything to our professions. So if we can find an environment that makes us the happiest, I encourage you to please explore it. And that is it. Um, I wanna thank, obviously, my class, my residents, all the people that were there for me along the way, they were incredible. Uh, Dr. Kendall, you are incredible. <laughs> you are the definition of mentorship and a true mentor. And of course, Dr. Willis, who left, um, I just wanted to thank him for being so supportive, understanding throughout the years. Stephanie, for being a friend and ally, always on my side, incredible person. Our chiefs, thank you for changing and rechanging and rechanging the schedule and making things uh, not seem as bad as they were. And you guys have been troopers. I also want to mention previous class chiefs, Pam, that say here, as well as Eden Keen. Uh, we have Molly, we have Mo Hassel. You were not a chief, but you are awesome. <laughs>
and you've been a huge mentor and support of me throughout our initiative in Tanzania and everything else. Um, I do want to thank these particular residents. They've been the most incredible support system that love me with open arms, open heart, open mind. Carolina and Ben, you guys are amazing. And then, of course, my family, my friends, and my boyfriend love my life. And this is my happy place. And that is it. I'm guessing no RV questions or <laughs> questions. I'm okay with preliminary application questions, but if you have any other questions, uh, you don't have to address me here. Please do address me if you, I don't have much knowledge, but I can certainly uh, share my experiences with you. And uh, for anyone that's listening at home that's struggling also to find their path uh, within the EM, you can always come to me. That was very nice and very passionate. Oh, thank you, G. Love you. <laughs> Good. Always. <laughs> thank you. All right.